Okay, smile everyone. And we are live. Hello everyone and welcome to Cosmic Thursdays. My name is Sinan Du and I am in charge of education and public outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. I am also the main event organizer of this event. We are very grateful um, to see all of you here tonight with us at this virtual lecture. We warmly welcome the newcomers and are also very excited to see some of the returning attendees. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Edgar Rivera Valentin, who is a staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Texas. Dr. Rivera Valentin got his PhD in space and planetary sciences from the University of Arkansas. After that, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Brown University and later as a uh, staff planetary scientist at the Arecibo um, Observatory before he joined his current position at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Dr. Rivera Valentin studies the solar system objects as an entire system using an interdisciplinary approach. And his research interests mainly include planet formation, planetary habitability, and planetary defense. So in today's lecture, he will be talking about um, our current understanding of the near Earth asteroids, how we characterize them, and how we could protect our planet Earth from those potential impacts from those objects. Finally, I would also like to thank our lovely volunteers today, which you can see um, here in the chat and also on the Zoom meeting. We have five graduate students from both UCR and UCLA, and they will be helping us with the chat, uh, the live chat today. So all of them will be earning their PhD very soon, and they all have their advanced knowledge in the subject matter um, topic that we'll be learning about today. So now I will let them to introduce themselves. First, we have Jared. Hello, uh, I'm Jared Gillette. I'm a sixth year at UCR. Uh, and I was actually inspired to, to go into astronomy as a child at public events like this. So I hope you enjoy it. And I look forward to answering your questions in the live chat as they come in. Thanks, Jared. Next, we have Ming Fong. Hello, everyone. I'm Ming Fong. and also a PhD student and at UCR. And hope you enjoy tonight. Thanks, Ming Fong. Next, we have Ariel. Hi everyone, I'm Ariel. I'm a graduate student at UCLA and I'm studying planetary astronomy. So I'm looking forward to answer any questions you have. Cool, thank you, Ariel. Dave? Hi everyone, I'm Dave Malevsky. I'm a PhD scientist working at uh, UCLA and also I work on the NASA NEOWISE mission. So if you have any questions about comets or asteroids, please ask me. Um, I love NASA, so I hope you love NASA too. Awesome, thanks Dave. And last but not least, we have Sajna. Hello, I'm Sanjana. I'm a graduate student at UCLA again, and I work on asteroids. I've observed a few asteroids at Arecibo as well. So yeah, welcome. Thank you everyone. Um, so all these graduate student volunteers will not be presenting today. Instead, they will be moderating the live chat, which you can see on the right-hand side of the YouTube page. In the live chat, we welcome all kinds of questions and also encourage you to engage in discussions. The volunteer moderators will be answering most of the questions as you ask them, and the remaining questions will be answered uh, by the speaker at the end of this lecture. Since we're expecting a relatively large group today, we kindly ask you to be respectful to the others in the chat. Okay, so I guess uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, without further ado, take it away, Ed. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay, so you should now be able to see my slides? Yes, we can, we can see it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to talk to you today about one of my favorite subjects, which is planetary defense, near-Earth asteroids. 
and really the idea of avenging the dinosaurs and putting together all the Avengers, which really means these different facilities like the Odyssey World Observatory to protect the world from devastation. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna to hope to uh, let you in on why we care about planetary defense, uh, why do we study near-Earth asteroids, um, and what are some of the methods that we use to do so. On top of all of that, I'm going to be focusing in on my favorite observatory, which is the Odyssey World Observatory, which is located in Odyssey World Puerto Rico, which is actually where I'm from, which is also why it's my favorite observatory, obviously. So in this talk, I'm gonna let you in on why the Odyssey World Observatory was so important for planetary defense. And at the end, we'll go back and touch base with the legacy that Adesivo has left. So to begin, let's bring everything a little bit close down to earth when we're talking about planetary defense, something that you all may have seen and may be aware of. Maybe in August, you went outside at night and you looked up into the sky and you saw something really bright streak across it. Have you seen a shooting star? Have you seen this really nice little bright object come by? Do you know what that is? Well, a shooting star is just a fragment of an asteroid or comet that ends up falling through our atmosphere. And as it does so, it's going through the atmosphere with such high speeds that it burns up. And all of that energy comes off as something really bright. And you see it as a very beautiful streak of light. Here I have a little uh, comic representation what I mean by that. You have the Earth in its orbit, and if an asteroid or comet had gone through here and it left a little dust tail, when we pass through that, those dust end up falling through our atmosphere and we see that shooting star. A couple of words that you might have heard is the word meteor. That's that light you see. That object that's actually falling through, that's a meteoroid. And you may have gone online and tried to find and buy a meteorite. That's that object that finally makes it to the ground and you can actually pick it up. That's that thing from space. Now, these tiny things burn up mostly in our atmosphere and you see them as light, but what if we get a little bit bigger? So that happened back in 1908. It's called the Tunguska event. An object about 20 to 50 meters in size uh, came through our atmosphere. It too also mostly burnt up, but it was so big that it heated up the air and that big massive air, really hot air ended up coming striking in Russia and then bursting out, flattening the area and all the trees. You can see that in this black and white image. And what I just described, you can see as the cartoon representation here of that airburst, what we call an airburst. This happened on June 30th, 1908. And this date is important because every single year on June 30th, we celebrate what's called Asteroid Day. On that day, we remember that these type of events can happen and that we then come together to plan out how we can defend the world from future events. Now this was tiny, right? 20 to 50 meters. What if it gets bigger? We know what happens there. Planetary science and NASA, you know, we've sent missions across the solar system. We've gone to Mercury and we've seen these little potholes with a smiling face smiling right back at you. We've gone to the outer solar system, including the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And when we've looked at those ice balls, we see these holes called impact craters. And in fact, you don't really even have to send missions out to explore all of space. You can just go outside and look up at a full moon and you're gonna see a bunch of potholes all over its surface. Those are impact craters. Those are caused by one, one of these larger asteroids, something like hundred meters, even smaller. They come in and strike the surface. When they're striking the surface, they come in with so much velocity, so much energy, they're able to kick up all the dirt to blast it out. And that's what you see in this hole. They come in with so much energy that most of the time that asteroid just breaks up into little pieces and gets just thrown out all over the place. Now, we've seen these beautiful pictures. We've seen these craters all over our solar system. But have you seen a crater on Earth? Well, 
it may have been difficult for you to spot one, but we know we have craters on the surface of Earth. In fact, here's a map of the Earth with a bunch of red dots all over it. Those red dots, that's not Earth having a chicken pox. That's actually the location of craters across the surface of the Earth. And you can actually go drive to one in Arizona. So if you're in the United States, you can drive over to Arizona and you can go see Meteor Crater. Now, if you haven't gotten the chance to do so, I highly suggest that Meteor Crater is super cool. Uh, right here in this image, I'm showing you uh, the picture of Meteor Crater. It has a little visitor center and this road that you can drive right up to. It lets you then go out and see and overlook this large, large feature. I mean, this picture really doesn't do it justice. It's really beautiful. So I hope you get a chance to do that. Now, amongst all of these craters, one of them really motivates us to study asteroids, really mot motivates us to think about defending the Earth. And that is this object right here in Mexico. That's the Shiksalub crater. We think that crater is the cause of the mass extinction event that led to the end of the dinosaurs. And like I mentioned, we're here to avenge the dinosaurs. So we know that when you start getting to these larger objects striking the earth, those objects can lead to mass extinction events. Those objects can lead to global devastation. And because we have the evidence that they have occurred and we have a space program, we need to think about doing something. Now, this isn't all doom and gloom though. Luckily, these larger events that are mass extinction causing, those events are rare. So on this slide, I'm showing you at a scale of size, how rare some of these objects are. I mentioned those little tiny dust particles coming in through the earth, making shooting stars. That's basically daily. Something on the order of a meter, well, that's about once a year, but don't worry, something about a meter that's not gonna really cause damage. That too will burn up in the atmosphere. It might just be brighter. Something in order of tens of meters, well, that might cause city damage, you know, destroy some buildings, blow out some windows. But those events, we think on average, they should occur once per thousand years. But remember, I said that Tunguska event was 20 to 50 meters. And that happened in 1908. We have another event that happened recently, um, again in Russia, and it happened in 2013. And that one was a 20 meter event. So we only had to wait a hundred years between those two. That's what's important to say. On average, these type of smaller events occur once per thousand years. Now, when we start getting to the dangerous ones, those hundreds of meters sized objects, those are the ones that can start causing regional devastation. We're talking about maybe an entire state um, getting damaged. We're talking about causing you know, all the dirt that, that got kicked up, causing changes to that local climate. Luckily again, that happens once every 10,000 years on average. And that type of mass extinction event, that one event that we need to avenge the dinosaurs for, that one, that one comes every once, every million years. So that one's super rare. So that's what I mean. Although the really massive ones, although those ones that could change all of everybody's life, that would change the face of the entire earth, although those are extraordinarily rare, we know they happen, we have the evidence for it. And the smaller ones occur a little bit more often and they could still cause damage. All right, so then how do we defend the world and what do we mean by that? And that's the idea behind the term planetary defense. In planetary defense, we care about these four different aspects. We want to make sure we find the asteroids, but it's not just finding them, right? Because you can find something and then lose it. I constantly lose my cell phone and the TV remote. That definitely gets lost a bunch of times. So I have to keep track of things, right? So I need to get enough data to make sure that I know it's there and I can predict where it's going to be now in 
the next 10 years, next 100 years, next couple hundred years. And then I need to take that a step further. I not only want to become a Nostradamus and predict when something might happen, I need to make sure to get enough information on it to characterize it. How big is it? How much of a danger are you actually? What shape are you? Are you a fluffy thing or are you a big space rock? And then once I characterize it, I can put all of that information, send it off to the mission experts, to the engineers, the people at NASA, and they can put a mission together to do something about it. Because unlike most of the natural disasters that we face here on earth, like a hurricane, and I know a hurricane, I faced Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, like earthquakes, like tsunamis. Some of those, we have people that let us know, hey, this thing's coming towards you and the next week you need to prepare or you need to evacuate. But we don't have a ray gun that lets us move that hurricane away yet. With an impact, we have the ability to make sure that we know where these objects are gonna be. We have the ability to predict if and when they'll become a danger to earth. And then we have the technology to do something about it, to send a mission up there, to push that object just a little bit away so it completely misses us. Or in the worst case scenario, you blow it up. Because again, we know this happened to the dinosaurs and they were there protecting us mammals. They gave their dinosaur teeth so that mammals can later evolve and we can have the animals we have today. So we can never forget, we have to avenge the reptiles. Okay, so then let's go through, the, through these steps, finding them, getting the orbits down, characterizing them, and then avoiding an impact if we need to. So how do we find them? Well, luckily we have a bunch of astronomers, a bunch of planetary astronomers who spend their nights looking up into the sky, observing looking to see if they can see something change in the night sky. And when they see a little dot move, hey, that might be an asteroid. They can then send that data out to NASA and NASA can let them know, yes, that's a new one or no, we knew about that one. We also have the technology to send spacecraft out into space. And those spacecraft can also look around to spot new objects. And we're also putting together even newer, better spacecraft to go out to find these objects. This slide here is showing you an example of one of those newer spacecraft that we're hoping to launch in the next decade. That one's called NEAWSOME because it's an awesome mission. It's called Near Earth Object Surveyor Mission. The point of this mission is to have a space telescope up there to find these asteroids. Because when you're on Earth and you're looking through a telescope at the night sky, you have to wait for night. Instead of waiting for night, if we have something out in space, we don't care if it's night or day, we're just pointing all over the place. So now that we find them, let's see what we have found actually. In this image, I'm showing you what I call the beehive. This beehive is all of these near Earth asteroids that we have found over the many, many years that we've spent looking up into the night sky, sending missions out into space, getting all of that data. Now, most of you know that most of the asteroids, you know, we, when we think of asteroids, we think about objects in the main belt, right? And those objects are between Jupiter and Mars. So of those 600,000 asteroids that are known, some of them end up getting closer to Earth. So they surpass, they go beyond Mars and we start calling them a different name. And then some of those get even a little bit closer to Earth and we call those potentially hazardous. So out of those 600,000 asteroids we have, 2,000 of them might be potentially hazardous. And of those, 200 of them are larger than a kilometer in size. So remember, those that are larger than a kilometer in size, the reason I point them out, that's the size that we care about when we're talking about that global devastation. So when we're trying to find asteroids, we also set priorities. We wanna make sure we're looking for the big ones. We wanna make sure we know all of the big ones and then all of those middle tiers, those hundreds of meters. Let's make sure we find all of those because those are the ones that you know, will go from global uh, devastation to significant regional devastation. 
And in fact, this is so important that the Congress of the United States has enacted laws that direct NASA to go and find and catalog objects that are larger than about 100 meters to make sure that the ones that pose significant danger to Earth, we know well enough. The middle tiers, we still it doesn't mean that the middle tiers, we're not trying to find them and we're not trying to catalog them. Of course we are. We, those can still cause some levels of damage, but we set our priorities to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. Now on this slide, and while I've been talking, I used a couple of words, right? Potentially hazardous object, near earth asteroid. It's important to define those terms because sometimes they might be used to strike fear. So one of those uh, words that can be used to strike fear is that word potentially hazardous, right? It has the word hazardous in it. But let's really figure out what we mean as scientists by a potentially hazardous object. So again, remember most asteroids that when people think of asteroids, they're in the asteroid belt that's between Mars and Jupiter. When one of those asteroids, their orbit changes and it brings them interior to the orbit of Mars, we call those near earth asteroids. In this orbital diagram that's being represented by the blue circle. Now, if then there is one of those objects that is larger than 100 meters, the ones that could cause de uh, devastation to Earth, and comes close enough within 20 Earth moon distances, that then starts being called a potentially hazardous asteroid. Um, sometimes you'll also hear the term potentially hazardous object because it's not just asteroids that can come close, it's also comets that come close. So we can use the word object to allow um, to talk about both asteroids and comets. Now, notice here that this does not mean that a PHA, potentially hazardous asteroid, is going to impact. It's just big enough and it gets close enough that we should keep an eye out on it. Now, it gets close enough in air quotes because that word earth moon distance 20 Earth moon distances is actually still pretty far. And again, sometimes when you see news articles in the media, you'll see something like an asteroid's coming really close. It's 10 Earth moon distances or 30 moon Earth moon distances. And, and they do that to get click on their article, but that's not actually close. And a really good way of imagining that, because I don't know about you, but for me, it's difficult to imagine these really large astronomical scale distances. To imagine this, consider this. Between the Earth and the moon, you can take all of the planets in the solar system, including Jupiter, right? I'm gonna stress, including Jupiter, and you can fit them neatly between the earth and the moon with space to spare. So now, keeping that in mind, remember that a potentially hazardous asteroid is cataloged as one that's big enough and gets at least within 20 earth moon distances, 20 times all of these things added up together, right? That starts letting you know, okay, this, is, this isn't something I should immediately get scared about but this is something that I should be weary about. Keep an eye out for, be cautious, be thinking about. Okay, so now we've learned about how we find these objects with ground-based telescopes and sometimes with space-based telescopes. We've learned about the future. We're going to improve that technique by sending a, space, a, a spacecraft that will be observing these objects or trying to find more of them. Now let's go to that next step. We need to make sure that we not just find them, we keep a track on them. And that's really where the power of radar best shines. The Odyssey Observatory in Puerto Rico was the largest, most sensitive, most powerful planetary radar until its very last day in December of 2020. There's another radar called the Goldstone Solar System Radar that also has now continued to observe near Earth asteroids to keep us safe, to keep track of them. The power of radar comes in in that unlike most telescopes, 
you know, think about it. You go outside with a telescope or binocular, you look up, you're really waiting for that random light from space to after it's traveled many, 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 many long distances to finally make its way and hit your eye so you can see it. That's, that's actually really cool to think about that. You have to, out of all of existence, this one random photon traveled so long just so you could see it. But in planetary defense, we don't kind of just want to sit around and wait for something to hit our eye. We want to make sure we're spotting things. And with radar, you're shining a light out into space to light up these asteroids so you could see them. That allows radar the ability to measure two things really, really precisely, the distance to the object and its speed. So typically asteroids are traveling hundreds of millions of kilometers away from the earth. I just mentioned that the ones that are called PHAs get as close as 20 ethnic distances and that was really far. With radar, I can tell you precisely how far away that object is down to a meter. And typically these objects are moving dozens and tens of kilometers per second. And I can tell you with radar, that speed, that velocity, down to centimeters per second. That's the precision that radar gets you. Now, that isn't just to sound super fancy. That's actually the type of data you want if you want to keep track of these objects. When we first find these objects with a ground-based telescope, we have a lot of uncertainty. We found you and I think you're gonna be over here. And then you have to keep observing and go, okay, actually you weren't where I thought you'd be. You're gonna be a little bit over here. So we can improve our prediction. We keep doing that and keep doing that. You have to keep doing that for a really long time to make sure you nail down the orbit of this object and you can predict really precisely where it's going to be. With radar, instead of waiting a really long time, as long as you find it and let me know where it is, I can then point the radar up there, get data, you know, three minutes of data, and we can go from something very uncertain to something very precise. So on this slide, I'm showing you a cartoon image of what I mean. And it is literally a cartoon image. I am not an artist, so I just kind of put together this thing. On this side, I'm showing you what I would think of as a very uncertain orbit. And I'm demonstrating that to you through a very thick cyan line or circle here, ellipse really. Um, the asteroid can be anywhere within this thick ellipse. And in this image, it looks as if, you know, it's on top of the earth. So in this cartoon, this object could be, you know, could have an, a, the chance of hitting the earth. The power of radar is going from something like this to something like on the other side where we went from that very thick ellipse to a very nice fine ellipse. And I know now it's gonna be here, here, or here. And in fact, if we zoom in, there's a nice little square there next to the green square, which is representing the earth. And you can see that they're far away enough from each other. So this object is going to miss the earth. Now, although this is a cartoon that I drew here for you, this is actually that something that has happened. So when we first observed and discovered the asteroid Apophis, we thought it could impact the Earth in 2029. But then radar came along and said, nope, I'm gonna decrease all those uncertainties and let you know that it is getting really close, but it's not gonna impact. And in fact, Apophis comes really close within geostationary satellite close on Friday, April 13th, 2029. So yes, I did say Friday the 13th. That is a little weird. I know, I, I kind of freaked out too. Friday the 13th, that's just really bad luck day. But don't worry, radar taught us it's not gonna actually impact. It just gets really close. You'll be able to go outside and see it depending on where you are on the earth. And in fact, continued radar observations and other observing techniques like ground-based optical facilities have been able to put all of their data together and we could rule out the danger of Apophis 
for the next century. We know it's not gonna impact the earth over the next century. Now, some of you know, the Odyssey Observatory is no longer with us as of 2020, in, uh, as of 2020 December um, because of the catastrophic failure. But the last object that Odyssey observed is called, was called 2020 and K1. That object, when it was first discovered, was thought to have a really high impact chance. But because of the last observations that Asiwo did, we were able to rule that out. And we know that that object is also likely not going to impact the Earth. That's the power of radar. And that has been one of the legacies of Adesivo. Now radar and other observatories, we wanna go beyond being a fortune teller. We wanna move beyond being that Nostradamus. We don't just wanna say, hey, this is gonna happen in 2030, watch out. We wanna do something more. And luckily, radar can do that. You can imagine radar as if it's a flashlight. We have a nice little dish right here. This is actually the Goldstone Solar System radar and it emits light out into space. That light then hits this object and bounces back and gets collected on the dish. It's basically like a camera. So on your iPhone, you have the flash setting, right? So that when you take a picture, the flash on your phone goes off and emits light. That light then goes and hits something in front of you and comes back and your phone collects that light and you get a picture. Similar to how that works, radar works. We send a light, we receive it, and we can get a picture. Now, the images that we get in radar aren't the images that you might be used to. So when you take a picture of me with your phone, you're gonna be able to measure how tall I am and how wide I am. When we take a radar image, the dimension going up and down, that is definitely distance, which is good because we want to know how big this thing is. And so with this picture you see here, we can go, all right, from here to here, it's X, it's about 370 meters. So now I know how big this thing is. This axis from side to side is not telling you exactly how wide it is though. And it's what we call the Doppler axis. It really relates to the rotation of the object and its spin, all right? But we can take that information and still map it into this spatial looking image. And then this example that I'm showing you here of a radar image, this is of an asteroid called 2014 HQ124. This object's about 370 meters. And one of the things I like to do with these is to see, you know, use it as a, okay, what type of animal am I seeing? So while you're looking at this from home, stare at this. What type of animal do you see? I see a penguin. All right, I'm gonna walk you through the penguin. So this is the head, this is the beak. These are the eyes. This is the little fin of the penguin. And these are its little happy feet. It's really just happy feet floating up into space. See, isn't that fun? Now, although these type of images aren't exactly the picture you would take, they still tell you a lot about the shape of the object, not just its size. So this was a really nice, one of the better pictures that we can get with radar. Here's a not so nice picture. So here is an image of the asteroid Itakawa. And on this side, you see it as it looked to the spacecraft Hayabusa. On the other side, you see how it looked to radar. And you can see, you know, on our bad days, the images don't look that pretty, but, but they still tell us a lot. And if I looked at this radar image, I'd say this is, I would predict this asteroid looks kind of long, peanutty shaped. It's not a sphere. You have like a little lump on this side, then this other side's a little bit longer. And, kind of looks like maybe something is sticking out on its end because there's a bunch of bright pixels there. Okay, then we sent Hayabusa to Itakawa and this is what we get. A peanutty shaped thing with a tiny lobe, a longer one, and hey look, something is sticking right out at the end of the asteroid. So even on our worst days, our image, hey, it looks exactly like what 
Hayabusa saw. We were able to predict what this asteroid shape looks like. We were able to provide that information to spacecraft. All right. Now, besides taking these still shots of an object, well, we can make little movies, right? Because what really is a movie? A movie is just a bunch of pictures taken really close to each other and then put next to each other really fast and they'll look like a little movie. You can do the same thing with radar. So on this side, I'm showing you a GIF of the asteroid called 2015 TB145. This asteroid was observed on October 30th, 2015. And we, you could see here, we put together a bunch of different radar images and you'd see the object actually spinning. And we could start seeing different faces on the object. But it's not just seeing different faces. If you take a still shot, this is 2015 TB 145 right here. I don't know about you, but like this one doesn't look like an animal to me. This looks like a skull. And in fact, when we observed this, somehow it got out to the media that we stared at it and we're like, oh, look, it's the skull. And then there was a news article saying, observatories uh, take picture of flying, potentially hazardous asteroid that's on fire and it's a skull, it's heading towards us. And okay, all of that was wrong in so many different ways. It was a little weird to observe this though, because notice October 30th, it's the day before Halloween. And in fact, we took this image like at 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. at night. So it was at nighttime. We were all wanting sleep and we got this and it was, um, hmm, wait, there's a skull and it's almost Halloween, how interesting. That's actually one of the reasons, one of my favorite objects. But it turns out that this is not a flying skull in space that it is on fire, don't worry. Remember, radar is like a flashlight. So this is the same object, 2015 TB145, but observed on the next night, observed in a different geometry. And this time when we shed that light up there, you now can notice two little thingies here sticking out and they get bright, but behind them, they're kind of dark. Radar is like a flashlight. So when we shine that light up there, if there's something sticking up, it's gonna get that light and bounce it back. But behind it, that light's not gonna reach it. So it's gonna create a shadow. In fact, I took a still shot and I had it here so you could see that really bright part and the shadow right behind it. And that's what we think caused those features on the first image that ended up making this asteroid look like a skull. It's just something causing those shadows behind it. But Besides going, oh wait, radar is like a flashlight and cast shadows, these are boulders sticking up on this asteroid. I just did some geology on an asteroid that's hundreds of millions of kilometers away without needing to send a spacecraft up there. I did it from Earth by just turning on my telescope. We can do geology of asteroids. We could really study the surfaces of these objects from Earth really super well by taking these radar images. And when you put all of these types of rotations and radar images and you observe this object over a bunch of different nights and you get also data from other different telescopes, you can put it all together to create what is called a shape model. A shape model is a fully three-dimensional understanding of what this object looks like. Here on this slide, I'm showing you a bunch of different shape models that have been produced for asteroids. And you can see their shapes are just, you know, a bunch of different shapes. You can go from the canonical, hey, look, there's a sphere, to there's a diamond, there's a blobby thing, there's an elephant face right there. You can see like little ears on the outside and it's now coming out. Um, there's a dog bone. They're a bunch of different sizes and shapes. And you really want to know what the shapes are because if I'm going to send the spacecraft up to this object, the shape changes how the spacecraft is going to encounter it, right? It's going to change the gravitational environment of it. So if we're going to get really up close to these objects, we wanna know something about the shape so we can better prepare those engineers 
who are putting together the flight paths and sending these spacecraft up there. And in fact, radar and radar data and putting together these different shapes have actually assisted NASA in sending missions to asteroids. Recently, we visited the asteroid venue with the spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx. And that was facilitated by the type of data that we got with Odyssey Wool, which I'm showing you here. Putting together that shape model, putting together the characterization of this object, letting people know we think it's going to be this type of surface. We think over here there will be a boulder. We think this is gonna be the shape, really helped prepare the expectations for the spacecraft and the science that the spacecraft would be able to do at this object. Now, it's not just about sending spacecraft to do science to better understand asteroids, because asteroids are really interesting from a science perspective. They're the leftovers of planet formation. So if we want to understand fundamentally where we came from, we need to go study asteroids. But because they pose a danger to us, we also got to understand them and send stuff up there to do something about it. What can we do about it? Well, if movies taught me anything is that we sent Bruce Willis up on a space rocket, it goes up there and explodes this asteroid. And then it turns out that wasn't a completely good idea and there's repercussions because you destroyed it like that. So, okay, the movie taught me that maybe we should avoid that, right? And this is what we want to avoid. But if something is, you know, a month out, two months out, that's not a lot of anticipation to do something about it. So we might need to destroy it. But again, with all of these different observing techniques and the reason we're trying to find them and track them is so that we don't have to say, okay, this one's a month out. No, find them, track them so we can say, okay, this one in the next 200 years, we need to do something about it. Because the doing something is the changing its orbit. All we have to do is nudge it a little bit so that it just misses us. When you have that 100 years or so anticipation, if you go up there and just go beep, that little beep over time grows and grows and grows and grows, and it just completely misses us. A couple of ways that we thought about it is I'm on this slide, I have a cartoon of a spacecraft going up and spray, spray painting the face of the object. That's actually one of the ways that we thought about it. If you spray paint one face really white, that face is gonna be brighter when the sun hits it, it's gonna reflect more sunlight back, and that's gonna act like a little thruster that's gonna end up potentially changing the where this is gonna go. But the technology that we're actually going to test to demonstrate that we can change the orbit of these objects so that they miss us, that one's called the kinetic impactor. And we're going to test this next month. On November 24th of next month at 1.20 a.m. Eastern time, we're going to launch the double asteroid redirection test mission or the DART mission. It is gonna to go to a pair of asteroids a big asteroid and its little moon. The asteroid is called Didymos and its moon is called Dimorphos. Why they didn't stick with calling the moon Didymoon, I don't know. Obviously it should have been called Didymoon, but it's called Dimorphos. The mission is gonna go to the tiny moon and it's going to use a kinetic impactor to change the orbit of the moon around the bigger object, um, now, that word kinetic impactor, that kind of sounds fancy, right? It's a fancy way of saying we're going to go up to it and we're going to knock into it. We're just going to and that is going to impart energy onto that little moonlit and we're going to change where it's going to go. Then we're going to observe the system and we're going to see if the orbit of that moon around Didymos changed exactly like we predicted it. And if it did, then we've demonstrated that this technology works and it is viable to protect us. But even if the orbit doesn't change exactly like we predicted, we're going to learn so much about what this technology can do that we'll be able to refine it and improve our ability to defend ourselves. And again, in order to send this mission there, we needed to characterize this object. In order to characterize the object, we needed a bunch of ground-based telescopes, including the power of radar. In order to be able to facilitate sending a spacecraft there, we need to put a shape model together. 
That involves the power of radar. In order to then make sure that the test worked, we need to observe the system again afterwards with a bunch of ground-based telescopes, including radar. That, that's one of the most powerful legacies of the Odyssey World Observatory. You may not have heard of this observatory in the beautiful island of Puerto Rico, but this observatory was around for decades, protecting you from asteroids, all in this beautiful island. Now, that's what they call a super powerful legacy, but truly, deeply, the Odyssey World Observatory did so much more than that. The true and most powerful legacy of the Odyssey World Observatory is its legacy of inspiration. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I'm from the city of Arecibo. I grew up here. I'm in science because of this place right here. I went up there, my parents took me, and I, I can't describe to you what it's like to look over on the dish. It's awe-inspiring, it's shocking. Later in life, I got to go back and work at the telescope in the planetary radar group, doing all of these observations. But I also got to run a program called the Odyssey Observatory Space Academy. And I got to see kids, high schoolers, come up to the telescope and be inspired. The true legacy of the Odyssey Observatory, besides protecting you, has been inspiring generations of Boricua scientists. That is the power of Odyssey World. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you so much. I hope you learned about the power of radar, the power of telescopes, and the fact that you're safe because there's a bunch of people out there observing the night sky, making sure you're sleeping well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ed. That was a, a terrific lecture. And I, I also appreciate you sharing the personal story. Um, it was always beautiful to see how the younger generation gets expired uh, by any of these telescope facilities and later just devote themselves into science. So thank you. And we actually have some great questions from the left chat. And um, for everyone who is still with us now, um, it's almost your last chance uh, to put your questions in the chat. And uh, we are now going to do a Q&A. So to start with, um, I have a question from Jason Durr asking to what extent uh, would an impact crater from asteroids hitting the earth um, would have a smaller size than that of an asteroid with the same size hitting somewhere without an atmosphere? Okay, good question, good question. So the effect of the atmosphere is to ever to shield you basically from some of the objects. Um, like I mentioned, some of these sizes as they're coming through earth just get heat superheated by our atmosphere because of friction between the gases and the object and it gets broken up. A really good example actually is Venus. Venus's atmosphere is ridiculously thick. And so not many objects actually get to make it to hit the surface of Venus. The ones that do get to make it are those really big and powerful objects. So the craters that are on Venus are mostly those large um, craters. When we go and talk about smaller objects that don't have atmospheres like the moon um, or these icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, they are littered with craters from super, super tiny, um, tiny when I say tiny, all the way up to ridiculously big covering an entire hemisphere. If you haven't done it, you should Google the moon Mimas. Um, it's really neat. It looks like the Death Star. Um, but yeah, that's the effect of an atmosphere. It just shields you from some of the objects coming through. Thanks, Ed. Um, the next question is from a prodigy math prince um, asking, is there any way to prevent asteroids from getting to Earth? So I believe you've already covered this, but it was um, asked at, at earlier um, in the lecture. So just in case you want to you know, do some summary here. Yeah. There definitely is. We are going to test a technology to actually move an object away. Um, it's gonna be the little moon, right? Uh, we wanna make sure the technology works before we actually test it on something that actually move that thing away from us. But one of the ways is you go up there and you just knock into it. When you knock into it, you give it a little push and it changes the orbit. You can go up there and you can spray paint one side of the object. Now that side is much brighter. It reflects more sunlight. And that acts like a little thruster. And over time, that also changes the orbit. 
There's another one actually called a gravity tractor, which I didn't talk it, which I didn't describe in my talk, but there you send an object that kind of just parks next to it. Um, and that consistent parking, because all mass has gravity, over time is able to tug this thing away and just move it. But the point of all of these things is you want enough time, enough anticipation, so that you don't have to go up there and give it a really strong push. You just go up there and give it little tiny pushes over time that later on add up to be a big push. Yeah, so that's why it's very important for us to predict where the asteroid would be um, in decades. So we could, uh, exactly. you know, start these actions early. Very cool. Um, next question from Sheila D asking, um, do you have to track these asteroids from different vintage points on our planet? Yeah, that's actually part of how we improve our ability to, to reduce the uncertainty in the orbit. If you observe it from you know, the West Coast, the East Coast, somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, putting all of that data together and seeing the motion in the sky relative to where you are, all of that can be put together to improve our prediction of where this object will end up being by reducing those uncertainties. Great, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question from Lexi G asking, uh, how does the Earth's gravity affect asteroids? Is it more likely to fling the asteroid changing its velocity or pulling it inward? Good question. So the, whenever an asteroid gets really close to a large object, if it doesn't end up crashing into it, um, it can get flung and so its orbit ends up changing. It could end up then uh, having an orbit that ends up more often meeting and up and getting closer to the planet. The other thing that could actually happen that's really interesting, asteroids are mostly what are called rubble piles. Um, in order to think about a rubble pile, when you go to the beach and you're playing with sand, think of taking that sand and then throwing it up into space. And it's just the blob of sand floating up inside there, right? It's not a rock. It's not something stable floating up there. A rubble pile is just this little blobby thing of sand. So if that blobby thing of sand gets close enough to the earth, it could go from a nice sphere to get stretched out. And so it could actually start changing the shape of these asteroids. So it changes both orbit and shape. I like that analogy. Um, thanks, Ed. Next question from AC. Um, originally, this was more like a comment um, from him saying, well, the Goldstone Clistrons don't have as much power as the Arcebol ones did. Did. So um, I just wonder how would that affect our ability for detecting uh, these asteroids? Good question, yes. So right now the active planetary radar that we have observing asteroids is the Goldstone Solar System radar. The, there's a bunch of differences besides the one you noted about the Klystron, so the power of that radar. So that means how powerful that flashlight is. But a really good flashlight not only needs to be powerful, it needs to be big, right? I just see what was 305 meters. Uh, Goldstone is 70 meters. 305, 70, that, that, there's a difference there. So there's another difference that's actually good for Goldstone, and that is the way I just see what observed, the dish didn't move, this big thing behind me. What moved is the platform. The platform itself moved across, and it's able to then track an object as it's floating around. Goldstone is smaller, so they can actually literally move its dish. That means, Without a seawall, we could only see a certain percent of the night sky. Goldstone could track the asteroid from the moment it came up to the moment it set. So it got more data off of it. However, when you run through the numbers, it comes out that out of seawall is 15 times more sensitive than Goldstone. And on an average year, out of seawall was able to see twice as many asteroids as the Goldstone solar system radar. So without out of seawall or a telescope like out of seawall, we're missing out on seeing half of these objects. Wow, that's quite a significant fraction. Yes, yeah, it is. Hmm. Cool. Um, my next question from uh, Yorki Jen Talkbergen uh, asking, how do the asteroids get their shapes? Ah, good question. So this is an active area of research in planetary science, looking at the 
change of shapes for asteroids, how that happens and how you can get from something that looks like a bone to something you know, moving from a sphere to a diamond. Um, maybe what happens if these two spheres hit each other? What does that happen? Uh, so that would, if you have two spherical looking things hitting each other and they stick to each other, you have a contact binary. Um, sometimes the contact binary can evolve uh, as they try to like move away from each other again and they cause like a little neck. And then you have that dog bone shape. That is one idea about how you get it. We don't exactly quite know. We're still learning a lot about how these shapes evolve. There was a recent paper that actually came out um, this summer saying how you can go from a spherical looking object into a diamond shape. And the reason they really cared about that diamond shape is we went to Bennu, we saw a diamond. We went to, uh, what was that other one? There was another object that went to, it, they looked like a diamond. They're really different shapes, uh, different sizes too, and they looked like a diamond. The idea there was that if you have a sphere of a rubble pile, and it's rotating over time, things try to seek the center. And as they seek the center, all those little rubbles just and come down to the equator forming that ridge that ends up looking like a diamond. But yeah, this is an active area of planetary science research. We're learning a lot more about how these objects move. The more objects that we can send spacecraft to and the more that we can take images of. Great, thank you. Um, next question again from Lex UG, asking how do the different shapes of asteroids affect their travel through space? Oh, okay, yeah. So I didn't get to talk about this in, in, in here, but there are different processes that actually depend on the shape of the object that could end up changing how it rotates and its orbit over time. So if, you have, let's say you have a dog bone shape, right? And whenever the dog bone, uh, the tiny part of the dog bone is looking at the sun, there's only a little bit of reflection coming out here because this is a tiny area, right? And then suddenly you get to the long side, you have a much longer area emitting a lot more light back out. And then you go tiny, long, tiny, long. That change in, there's a little bit of radiation, there's a lot, there's a little, there's a lot can over time start changing how this thing rotates, can over time, depending on how it's working, actually also be that nudge that I explained when we said we could go up there and just spray paint the side of it. It could be that nudge that ends up shifting the orbit of the asteroid. So the shape does come into play when it's interacting over many, 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 many years with sunlight coming in. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, and final question, this is actually from me. Um, I was especially intrigued uh, when reading about the asteroid that's gonna pass by in 2029. Um, so I know, well, if I understand it correctly, it's gonna be um, reaching really close to the, the earth. Uh, it's about like 10 times uh, closer to the earth than the moon is. So I just wonder, you know, even if it's just a flyby, what kind of impact uh, would it have on earth even? It's just not gonna leave an impact crater, but you know, in general, what, what effect would it have? So the impact is more on Apophis itself. Um, we will be, there's been a couple of models trying to predict, can it change the shape a little turns out it's not gonna change the shape itself, but it could, because again, these are rubber piles, when it gets that close and it changes away, that little extra gravity tug can maybe make a little uh, mass flow. So like a, a gully or something end up forming on Apophis. It can also, as it comes out, ends up giving it a little uh, spin, change uh, its rotation there. But really the biggest thing that it's going to impact in terms of Earth is, this is a great opportunity. You have an asteroid that's potentially hazardous, that's gonna get ridiculously close to the earth. People can go outside and see it. We don't have to spend millions of dollars, billions, billions of dollars sending a spacecraft. You can send a little CubeSat up there and take a picture of it. You can do a bunch of different experiments because this is an amazing opportunity to really get to know this object that really close. That's gonna be the biggest impact, the human impact, the science impact of having this opportunity. I really love your perspective and I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, this day in eight yes. years. Um, so yes. I've got to mark my calendar for that. 
Um, really cool. Well, thank you again, Ed. Um, so this concludes our lecture today. I would like to thank everyone again um, to be here uh, uh, do, to join us uh, tonight with us. Uh, we hope you enjoy the lecture and learn something really exciting. Um, so I would also like to take this opportunity to actually um, advertise for UCR Astronomy because we do all kinds of um, uh, outreach events. So uh, let me just quickly share my screen. There are several ways that you could follow us. One is we have a, a Facebook page. Um, so if you just simply search astronomy in UC Riverside or at Astro UCR, this is the page that you're gonna see. And whenever we have uh, an event scheduled that we will post it here. Um, and if you just like us or follow us, you'll definitely be notified this way or um, we also have a website called the Com Community Outreach uh, for Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. So here you could also see all the uh, already scheduled events coming up here if you wanna um, check from time to time. And uh, one last way would be to um, sign up for our email list, which you will have the chance to um, once you fill out uh, our survey. So we would really appreciate um, your feedback on our event, especially how we did tonight, um, so we could keep improving and also um, produce something of your liking. Um, so before we end uh, today's event, I would um, also like to uh, make an announcement because I will be leaving UCR at the end of November for a new position in Northern California. So this was actually my last Cosmic Thursdays. Well, not mine. Uh, it was given by Ed, but uh, this, this would be my, my last event um, here with UCR. So I would like to Thank everyone uh, for your support, especially during this special time uh, during COVID. And without your support, we couldn't have made it this far. Um, Cosmic Thursdays is one of our flagship programs uh, that we have been running for several years. And um, so moving forward, we will try to find someone to take over my role and uh, keep offering this free public engagement events whenever possible. So if you would like to be informed of our upcoming events, um, as I said, you could either sign up um, to join our email list or to follow us um, on all those uh, different channels. So I hope you enjoy. Um, and I think that's uh, probably it for tonight. Great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us and we hope you have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Adios. Okay, um <laughs> the chat